Welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Live with our distinguished guest, the Acting Medical Office of Health for the Niagara region, Dr. Herji. Dr. Herji, thank you so very much for being with us today. My name is Mishka Balsam and I will be the moderator throughout this webinar. Since launching our webinar series, we have spent much time on looking at the economic impact of COVID-19, the information and subsidies needed, tax and legal implications, municipal consequences, and we have heard from business leaders about the measures that they have put in place to strengthen their organizations. Today and on a monthly basis moving forward, our focus is on the public health response and the impact on owners, employees, and the community at large. While organizations and governments are responding to the ever-changing pandemic impact, businesses have questions, and we are privileged to have Dr. Herji agree to join GNCC's Espresso Live on a monthly basis, especially during these critical times. Dr. Mustafa Herji, the Acting Medical Officer of Health for the Niagara region, was appointed to the position in January of 2018. In this capacity, he is responsible for protecting the health of Niagara's 450 thousand residents and 14 million visitors through public health programs such as vaccination, preventing chronic diseases, health inspections, enabling children to get the best start to life, as well as land ambulance and dispatch services and emergency planning. Dr. Herji holds an MD from the University of Calgary and a Master of Public Health in Epidemiology from the University of Toronto. He completed specialty training through McMaster University, earning a specialty certificate in public health and preventative medicine from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And to all of us here in Niagara, for the past 14 months, he has become a household name. Today's format it looks like this. For the next 10 minutes or however long, Dr. Herji will give us an update, a critical update that is relevant to all businesses and organizations that have tuned in here today. Today's webinar is being taped and recorded and will be available to all of you as participants, but also um, will be made available through our social media channels as well as on our website. Following uh, that update from Dr. Herji, we'll actually open up all of our communication chats and um, any kind of functions of you asking directly any questions that are urgent to you. But please know that we've actually been uh, given and provided with a high number of questions already through social media or via email, and we're really committed to getting to all of them. And on that note, it is my privilege to hand it over to Dr. Herji. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction, Mishka. I'm just going to confirm that my slides are showing up and everybody can see those. Great. I have on at least a couple of occasions started presenting with my slides not showing up, which I think is the visual corollary of talking while you're still muted. So I always need to check on that nowadays. So I'll do a very just quick overview of what I see as a landscape of COVID-19 right now and where we are headed to hopefully give everybody a sense of what uh, we can uh, perhaps not so much look forward to in the near future, but maybe look forward to more a little bit farther out. And then we'll turn over to questions, which is I think where the most value from this session will hopefully come. So I think everybody's pretty well aware that cases of COVID-19 have gone up quite drastically. I'll just draw the curve here of what we've seen for daily cases on average in Ontario, and you can see, you know, this is our third wave now. We've, of course, gone higher than we were at any point in the second wave. The little bit of good news is that it looks like we might have hit the peak, and there's a chance we might be starting to be on the way back down. We only know if we've hit the peak in hindsight, so we'll have to see what that looks like in the next few days, if that's just, you know, maybe like a temporary bump like some of these were, or if that is actually going to be something sustained where we head down. But I'm hoping that it will be something that's sustained and you'll see the numbers start to improve a little bit. Uh, we are, you know, about two weeks out from the state home order, about three weeks out from the initial lockdown, and I'm hoping that, you know, turn down is uh, starting to see the effect of that. If we look at our Niagara cases just in a similar way, you can see it's a fairly similar pattern where we are you know, pretty close to the peak where we had of the second wave. And maybe there's again that evidence that things might be starting to turn around a little bit. Um, of course, to try and bring these cases under control, the province has had to institute those lockdown measures, which I'm sure have impacted many of you quite harshly. And I just want to show some of the modeling work the Ontario Science Table is showing, showing where things were headed in the province. So 
this gray line is similar to what I was showing. It was the daily cases on average in Ontario. And this actually is, if you look, January. So this was back in our second wave peak. This is our third wave heading up here. And what he was showing is that if we didn't do a lot to slow the spread of COVID-19, this would be the kind of trajectory that we would head off. So, you know, it would continue to go up quite drastically, cresting above 30,000 cases a day. If we instituted some lockdown measures, you could, you know, lower that increase down to this yellow line or then even down to this green line. Um, and so what the most recent orders of province has done is trying to get us onto this green trajectory where our cases might flatten out, you know, between five and 10,000 a day and maybe come down. And hopefully it actually looks like we might have peaked or closer to 5,000 a day based on the earlier graphs I've shown. The other part is showing is just the impact of how long those measures last. So if you keep them in place for four weeks, you know, you get the cases starting to head down, but then once you lift those measures, cases are going to start to rebound back up. If you keep it in place for six weeks, you delay that longer. And the significance of that is that if you delay lifting the measures longer, there's more time to vaccinate people. And so when you lift the measures, you don't see as sharp an incline as if you lifted them earlier. And of course, you're also starting from fewer cases, so there's fewer people to be spreading infections. And so what the Ontario science table with this graph was really advising the government was that there was a need for intense lockdown measures so we could bring cases down and then to keep them in place for a bit longer than the four weeks the province had originally advised to make sure that we get them low enough and far out enough that vaccine will help us keep things under control past then and we can start to do some reopening. Now, these are cases, and I, I'm sure everybody, you know, uh, recognizes that cases aren't the full story here. What we're really ultimately, I think, concerned about is people who get severely ill from COVID-19. People who need to be hospitalized, need to get into an ICU, or who unfortunately ultimately might pass away from COVID-19. And I just want to show how cases relate to that. I think it's fairly obvious that if you have more cases, there's a fraction of people who are going to be hospitalized is going to be a larger number. The fraction of people who get into an ICU or potentially pass away is a larger number. So I'm just going to draw here the graph of what active cases have looked like. And, you know, that pretty much matches with a first wave, a second wave, and a third wave. Uh, that's on this axis here. Hospitalization and ICU cases are much lower than active cases. Only a fraction of people go on to that severity. So I'm going to graph it on this axis just so I can scale that up so we can compare active cases versus hospitalizations. And so if we look at hospitalizations over the past year from COVID-19, it looks something like this. The first thing you'll notice is that, you know, in the first wave, the hospitalizations far, you know, or disproportionate to our cases as compared to the second and third wave. And that's actually a reflection that back in the first week, we probably weren't testing enough and we were missing a lot of cases. People who got severely ill enough to be hospitalized, they were tested, so we're picking those up, but we are missing the mild cases. And probably our actual case curve was something closer to looking like that, as opposed to what we actually did detect. But the second thing I want to highlight here is that when your blue line here of cases goes up, the orange line of hospitalizations is delayed. It's delayed about a week or 10 days before you start to see that go down. And then when your cases come down, the hospitalizations are delayed a little bit. You peak into your cases, your hospitalizations keep going up for a bit before they start to come down. And that's just because if you get sick with COVID-19, you fortunately usually don't start off severely ill, but your illness progresses over time and becomes worse. And so what we can expect is that if we are truly seeing, you know, the peak of our cases here, it might be another week, 10 days before we start to see the hospitalizations peak and start to come down. And then, of course, our hospitalizations are super high now. And so it'll be quite a while before those hospitalizations come down. And so I think for that reason, unfortunately, is another uh, reason why we're going to probably be looking at this lockdown extending for a little while, because we will need to get our hospitalizations back down and get our hospitals back into a state where they're able to manage the number of people getting sick from COVID-19. Uh, you've probably seen lots of the news around our hospitals being overwhelmed across the province, particularly in the GTA. Niagara Health uh, fortunately hasn't reached that point yet, but they did uh, put out a message the other day that they're now past 100% capacity for their hospital beds in their ICUs. And what they're doing is actually canceling surgeries 
transferring the staff in those beds into becoming additional ICU beds so they can deal with the surge of COVID-19 patients. And we'll probably be seeing those continue to increase for at least a couple more weeks. In parts of the GTA, uh, sorry, I'm just drawing in the ICU cases here, which of course saw a similar uh, trend to before. In the GTA, we've actually seen Sunnybrook Hospital building a field hospital in their parking lot just to prep for what they see as the spike of cases they won't be able to handle. It. That's really why we need to bring our cases under control with some lockdown measures is so we don't see our hospitals completely overwhelmed. And we don't get to the point where people actually can receive the hospital care that they need because we've just run out of beds because so many people are getting severely ill with COVID-19. The whole point of lockdown measures is really to try and stop the spread of infection. And of course, infection spreads when people have close contact with each other. If someone is potentially infected with COVID-19, possibly doesn't have symptoms yet or might actually be asymptomatic, they can spread it to someone else when they have close contact with them. And so what we're ultimately really trying to do is trying to break up people's social contact, keep people to spending time with just their household, whom they're going to be with anyway, but not with other people. So you break off opportunity for infection to spread. And by closing off public spaces and businesses and the like, you're basically taking away reasons for people to be away from their household and socializing with others. And it's an unfortunate necessity that we weren't able to get voluntary adherence to doing that. And it's unfortunately taken some of these more drastic measures. I just want to show you some data we get from cell phone mobility. So watching, you know, someone's cell phone and how far away is it traveling and to what locations is it traveling? And this is probably some data some of you actually use for marketing purposes to understand your uh, customer base and see how you can market to them. We're trying to use it to understand what is the behavior of people in terms of uh, the social interactions and how that might indicate spread of COVID-19. And so looking at people going to shopping and recreation, this is sort of what we've seen over the past year. So. Last year in March, we had our initial lockdown. And of course, lots of places are closed. People stop uh, being out and about. And then as we reopen, of course, that came back up. In December, we had our second lockdown that came back down. Not quite as low as we had it last year, but definitely came down and that helped things get back under control. And of course, we reopened in February. So people went out and about to shopping and recreation again. And with our newest lockdown measures, this is a few days old now, but so far we haven't gotten quite the same responses that we have for our previous two lockdowns. And I think this is what the province was thinking last Friday when they brought in some additional measures. They were really worrying about what they're seeing with the hospitals and wanting to drive this number down to be close to what we saw in the previous two waves. I think there's probably more work we can hopefully do to really advise, encourage, and educate the population the importance of them staying home. But I recognize it's becoming really hard for people to stay home and limit their social contacts after a year of really being starved of having some of these normal activities. And I think a lot of us are feeling fatigued from doing that. But seeing as what we're seeing with the hospitals, it's really critical. We try and help people stay home just a little bit longer till we get cases under control and we have our vaccinations up. Just to show you the flip side of this uh, mobility data, this is now looking at people staying home, staying in their residence. And you can see that spike during the first uh, lockdown last year uh, came down as we reopened, went back up during the second lockdown, not quite as high as during the first. And then with this most recent lockdown, we haven't yet seen that same response. And so again, we really wanna keep encouraging that message. Um, so that's what's happening with cases. I think the flip side of the, what we're doing is, of course, vaccination, which will hopefully get us to the stage where we don't need these kinds of lockdowns and we can start doing more sustained reopenings of our economy. Our vaccination approach has really been about focusing on age groups, and that's because older people are more likely to die from COVID-19, more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to end up in an ICU. So if we can protect the people most vulnerable, we of course take the edge off of the hospitalizations and the deaths, and we're perhaps able to tolerate things being a little bit more open. What some of the work the Ontario Science Table has done was this graph showing that if you are taking an age-based approach to vaccination, you'd you know, prevent the uh, number of cases by these gray lines. But if you took into account both the um, age, but also the 20% of neighborhoods that have seen the most spread of COVID-19, 
you can actually see a little bit of an increase in terms of uh, cases you prevent in your elderly group, much more in, of course, your younger group who's not yet getting vaccinated in large numbers, and you could actually prevent more cases overall. It actually means that instead of taking 59 people vaccinated to prevent one every case, you could actually bring it down to you're going to prevent a case with every 34 vaccinations. So actually close to doubling the efficiency of how much COVID-19 you can uh, prevent by uh, vaccinating uh, people according to the highest risk neighborhoods. Uh, it's been in the news, of course, that part of Niagara Falls has been actually deemed one of these high risk neighborhoods. And so while the rest of Niagara can book a mass clinic if they're 60 year olds enough, in those areas, you can actually book a mass clinic if one is 50 year olds enough. And we're gonna continue to focus and see what we're seeing in terms of spread there to make sure we try to get vaccinations to those who are seeing the most spread. So hopefully we can achieve something closer to these orange numbers in terms of uh, reducing the spread. If you looked at our website, you can see some of the progress that we're making on vaccinations. So, you know, with our 80 plus group, which is the first group we are vaccinated, we actually have over 95% of that group now vaccinated in Niagara. And we actually have bookings to take us close to 97%. So that's a really good news. The next age group that opened up the vaccination was 75 to 79. And we're actually at 92% with this group with bookings up to getting to 95%. And then even our 70 and 74% group, we've actually crested 80%. And we're on our way closer to 90% with them with the bookings that are already in place. And so that's some really good news, I think, so far that the you know first groups that we started to vaccinate, we've had a really good uptake by them. We've really got vaccines to protect them, which is why while we're seeing a lot of hospitalizations with COVID-19 right now, we've fortunately not seen the same number of deaths we saw in the first or particularly the second wave because the people most at risk of dying actually have been vaccinated this time around. And as we get to younger and younger groups, we'll hopefully be able to uh, protect people from being hospitalized as well. The 60 to 69 age group is the, where the bulk of our vaccinations are occurring now. And you know we're about 43% of them vaccinated. And at least in our clinics, we have bookings to take us up to about 70%. And you know, all of this doesn't account then for our bookings that might be in primary care or pharmacies to come, which will hopefully increase that number even more. Overall, looking at the entire Niagara population, we're close to 29% of our population vaccinated, and probably on Saturday, we'll crest 30% of our population vaccinated. And if you've been following, we seem to increase this by about 5% every week. So next weekend, hopefully, we can be at about 35%. Last thing I just want to mention is just what our vaccination rollout is looking like right now and who is up next. So we are, of course, focusing on the eldest age groups, and the province has actually moved up a lot of these age groups. So we're actually vaccinating all of these groups now in the month of April. People with high-risk health conditions at greatest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19, we're starting to vaccinate them, and one of their caregivers is also eligible for vaccination at this time. This is really transplant patients, patients uh, who have kidney disease, uh, patients who have um, respiratory issues that affect their breathing, they're up uh, for vaccination right now. And we'll move on to other health conditions later. Congregate settings, which are the kinds of places we see outbreaks, places like group homes, retirement homes, et cetera, we're vaccinating in those. And then of course the hotspot community, our L2G postal code in Niagara Falls is that one. I think one that is probably of great interest to most of you is people who can't work from home who are essential workers and when they're due for vaccination. And where the province has prioritized them is actually at the end of phase two, which is probably gonna be close to the month of June. And I know many people in this group want to be earlier and I fully understand that. I think everybody wants to be vaccinated earlier. The rationale here is that these are the groups who are most vulnerable at greatest risk of hospitalization, being in an ICU, dying. And we really wanna protect them before we move on to other groups who Fortunately, aren't as great as risk, but we also want to protect because they're perhaps the groups who are out and about, can work from home in the community at risk of getting COVID-19 and could potentially then spread it to others. So, you know, I know many people want to move up earlier, but that would mean some of these earlier groups get later. And so that unfortunately can happen. We have looked at our data in Niagara and we've tried to identify areas where you've seen lots of outbreaks. And we've taken a few of these groups and moved them a bit earlier to try and compromise a bit so that the areas where we see big outbreaks, we prevent those outbreaks, which also I think will hopefully relieve some of our healthcare capacity and our public health capacity. Uh, but most of these groups we can move forward. We're talking, I think about 75,000 people fall into this group in our estimates. 
and there's unfortunately not that amount of vaccine to go around right now. So we can't actually move everybody forward. So, you know, schools, we've seen a bunch of outbreaks and we thought it's really important we try to keep schools open. So we vaccinated education workers a bit earlier as one of those uh, groups. But most groups, unfortunately, I think are looking close to June when they can be vaccinated. But again, that's in phase two before we open up vaccination to everybody. I'll just quickly show you those uh, health, high-risk health conditions that are due for vaccination. This is the group we're currently vaccinating in, and then we'll be rolling out to some of these other groups, probably in the very next few weeks, mostly through May. And then once we get to the groups who can't work from home, this is a very short list. The lists are actually much longer, uh, but this gives you a sense of who some of these groups prioritized are. So, uh, you know, we've actually started on some of the education workers, but some of the other uh, workers who respond to critical events, food manufacturers, farm workers, they're actually going to be first up for vaccination. And then there'll be the rest of all the people who can't work from home, who work in critical industries. They will be due for vaccination next. And with that, I think I've spoken enough and I'll turn it over to Mishka to start asking me some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Herji. We really appreciate uh, appreciate the update that you have uh, provided today. Um, I just want to encourage all of our attendees uh, to utilize two of the Zoom functions that are available to you. One of them is the chat, normally located at the bottom of the screen for those of you who don't use it regularly. And the second option is uh, that right next to your name, there is a hand function. When you raise that, uh, it indicates this to us as panelists that you want to ask a question live and uh, we will unmute you uh, to do so. So we really encourage that. <clears throat> But just to get started out, uh, thank you for the overview of both uh, the lockdown and the uh, vaccination process. So one of the questions that Dr. Herji that has come forward, um, and that is often um, of interest to know for businesses because it has been difficult for businesses uh, to hear the announcement on such short notice often. In some cases it was less than 24 hours until some of the measurements and the rules have changed. And we see the necessity of why it has has to be done, uh, but I think uh, business always like a little bit more predictability. With the current lockdown, um, there is already the talk that it would likely be extended beyond the six weeks uh, before Ontario can safely reopen. And they are wondering, and business are wondering, if uh, what are your thoughts on it? Are we ready by May 20th or 21st, I think, is when this lockdown is ending? Is that what you anticipate to be the time, or do you foresee that it likely will be longer? Yeah, this is a bit of a crystal ball in guessing into the future. And I think we won't know for sure until we get there. My guess is it will probably be extended a bit past mid-May. Um, just, you know, I showed you the curve that, you know, cases would come down with that dotted green line, but they actually kind of plateau around two to 3,000 cases in the province and start to head back up. And I think at that point, we'll still be seeing a lot of people in the hospitals, a lot of people in ICUs. Those numbers won't have quite come down all the way that we wanted yet. And we'll have a need to unfortunately extend the uh, lockdown a little bit longer till we can get our hospitals back into a safe place. If we get lucky though, and we're maybe seeing that, you know, a real peak of our cases now, that could mean we actually start on that downward slope earlier and maybe we get lucky and we're actually at a better place by mid May. But I would be bracing for that lockdown to be extended a little bit longer, possibly into June. Okay. No, we appreciate it. And I think business do appreciate that real talk too, because then I think it allows uh, all of us to plan for what tomorrow looks like. Um, you had touched uh, on the um, point of looking at who's being prioritized for the vaccines and especially looking at the occupations and the risk rather than uh, the age and the age that people are under. Um, one of uh, the questions that have come forward is that now uh, pharmacies across uh, Niagara are offering vaccinations for 50 plus individuals, um, 50 or 55. Um, would it be worth redirecting those ones to those individuals that we define as being essential workers, i.e. the ones that are working in grocery stores, pharmacies, and others? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question. It's actually 40 years of age and up can get a vaccine in a pharmacy or primary care. Um, if you actually look strictly at the provincial plan, it talked about phase two, we go down to about 60 years of age, and then we move on to high-risk health conditions and those essential workers. So if we were strictly sticking to that plan, I think we would actually have those vaccines go to people who are 
with high risk health conditions and then to the essential workers and not down to the 40 and 50 year olds. I think the province has made a bit of a pragmatic decision here. There's unfortunately been a lot of news around AstraZeneca and I think many people have concerns about it. And the province really wanted to try and get those vaccines into arms. There's of course been some headlines about vaccines maybe not getting into arms and sitting in fridges. And so they expanded that age eligibility so that they could get that vaccine into uh, more people because more people would now be eligible for it rather than actually prioritizing it maybe to the higher risk of health conditions or the essential workers, which I think would have been a bit more logistically difficult. I think from a risk standpoint though, you're correct. It probably would have been better to send that to high risk health conditions and people who are these essential workers. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You mentioned the AstraZeneca vaccine and there's a few questions uh, that have come in on this one. And I'm going to get uh, to one specific one. This is from Hugh. Um, and the question is, when and where could uh, their 34-year-old daughter who has asthma receive, receive a vaccination? Uh, that's their understanding that AstraZeneca is not an option for uh, her age. And on that note, uh, thank you, Dr. Hirji, for answering that specific question. But maybe if I could also ask you for another minute or two to actually go over uh, the vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the safety issues and concerns that people are having. Sure. Maybe I'll start with that before getting into the uh, question that uh, Hugo had. Uh, so, you know, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, I think, has been plagued by a few things. Uh, first off, people have looked at the effectiveness of the vaccine and they've seen numbers that seem lower than for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and been quite concerned that maybe this isn't as good of a vaccine. And the first thing I think to highlight is that if you actually compare hospitalizations and risk of hospitalization, all of our vaccines basically push that risk to zero. The risk of dying from COVID-19 basically goes to zero, no matter which vaccine you get. The area where the study showed a little bit of difference was if you could still get some mild symptomatic illness. So you would get a sore throat, you would get you know, uh, sniffles, that sort of thing. It seemed in the studies that AstraZeneca is still a little bit more likely you got that than you did with Pfizer or Moderna. That's not a completely apples to apples comparison because it wasn't the same studies. These studies were done in different populations. They were done in different times. The AstraZeneca studies are particularly done in the fall when cases were on their way up, where Pfizer and Moderna actually were done in a time when there's fewer cases of COVID-19. And so you'd actually expect that there would be more people getting sick during the time that they're doing the AstraZeneca trial. So it's sort of expected that maybe it didn't come up with formally quite as strong of an effectiveness. No. So I think I'll just put that to bed first off, that I don't think anybody should be really concerned about the AstraZeneca vaccine. The thing we most care about is that we don't want to be hospitalized, we don't want to be dying from COVID-19, and that the vaccine is equivalent. The United Kingdom actually is using AstraZeneca as their primary vaccine, and they've actually had a real success in getting their vaccines out, bringing cases down, and they're, of course, starting to reopen as of last week with the help of that vaccine keeping them safe. And I think we should definitely have confidence that this vaccine is effective. In terms of the safety, there has been a very rare clotting issue where a clot forms actually in the brain uh, that has happened. It looks like it's probably close to about once out of every million people who are vaccinated. Maybe it's one out of every few hundred thousand who are vaccinated. So it's very rare. Uh, we're talking, you know, I think under 20 cases worldwide have been seen of this clotting issue. But nonetheless, it's been seen, and it does seem like it's a bit more likely to occur in a younger age group than it is in an older age group. So there's been at least one or two that have occurred in older age groups. But given many more people are vaccinating those older age groups, that does imply the risk is a lot less there. Um, it's still being researched what exactly is the cause of that clotting issue, but most governments are saying that there's, and there's it's a warning that this is a potential side effect of the vaccination. There's lots of you know, uh, very rare side effects to vaccination. There are people who could have a severe allergic reaction, for example. And you know, we accept that when we get a vaccine, there is some risk of a side effect, but the benefit far outweighs that risk. And I think that is absolutely true here for COVID-19. Your risk of getting COVID-19 and passing away from COVID-19 is greater than your risk of getting this rare blood clot. And the good thing is that now that we know the rare blood clot, we can advise people getting the vaccine of what symptoms to be watching out for so that you know if uh, you start to have those symptoms, you can get the right treatment for it and it's gonna keep you, you know, safe and not lead to anything worse. 
Health Canada has reviewed the data on the vaccine, and they reaffirmed last week that the licensing and approval for the vaccine remains that anybody 18 years of age and older is actually safe to get that vaccine. So they're not restricting the ages who can get the vaccine. It is actually still licensed for anybody age 18 and up. And so a primary care provider can actually make a decision that, you know, if someone has one of the priority reasons to get vaccinated, they have one of the high risk health conditions, they're a caregiver to someone who has a high risk health condition, they are actually eligible to be vaccinated no matter what their age is, as long as they're above 18. As a matter of policy to prioritize vaccines to older age groups, so if you don't have one of those health conditions, you don't have another reason to get the vaccination, it's just 40 and above as an age cat, uh, uh, age eligibility for the vaccine. So by virtue of being over 40 and no other reason, you're able to get that vaccine. And that's just prioritizing it to a group who is at greater risk because we know as you get older, you're greater risk. So in terms of uh, the you know person who you know is 35 has asthma, at this point, asthma isn't yet one of the prioritized reasons for getting vaccinated. So Unfortunately, the person wouldn't be eligible to get AstraZeneca yet. If they happen to be a caregiver for someone who has one of those transplants, or one of those more severe conditions, then absolutely. And as we work through the age uh, health conditions, if we do get to asthma at that point, of course, that person would then become eligible. Or at the point that the age uh, drops for prioritization to below 40, then that person would become eligible. So hopefully that answers that. I know I spoke a lot there on a couple of topics. And you know what, um, by by doing so, you actually answered a few other questions that have come in to us too, so, which is, I think, really good. But I was wondering if we can stay on the topic of uh, vaccine and the type mm -hmm. of vaccines. The government has opted to leave as much as four months gap between the first and second shots uh, for the COVID vaccine. Some health experts have said this is an inadvisable uh, um, move uh, and something that is often not being supported by the manufacturers. Can you shed some light on this debate and perhaps even what is the best course of moving forward? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting question here. So the manufacturers, when they were developing COVID-19 vaccine and they went out to test it, you know, they go do some animal testing and measure what the antibodies create in blood is, and then they actually develop it and start to go to the human trials for it. The human trials really were set to three to four weeks uh, interval between that first dose and the second dose. And that was because after that interval, they saw a benefit from that second dose that was significant. But another part was actually just pragmatism. We all wanted to get vaccines out and approved as quickly as possible. So if you do like a six month gap between the two doses, that means you need to run a clinical trial for six months longer than after, you know, you would see it if you did just a one month gap for the vaccine. And so it was actually a bit of a pragmatic decision to keep a narrow interval so you could get to your clinical trials earlier and get vaccines in the pipeline for approval earlier that that three to four week gap between the two doses was created, as opposed to necessarily being the absolute best gap for that vaccine. What we see with a lot of other vaccines, actually most other vaccines, is that actually when you stretch out the timing between doses, you usually get the same protection and actually sometimes better protection from a later second dose. And the interesting thing with AstraZeneca is they actually did that in a clinical trial. They had, most people got it four weeks apart, some people got it eight weeks apart, and then some people actually got it 12 weeks apart. And they saw that the effectiveness at four weeks apart versus eight weeks apart, it was higher to eight weeks apart. And then the effectiveness was even higher when you did it 12 weeks apart. And so based on that, there's some reason to suspect that actually it may work out with the other COVID-19 vaccines, but actually by spacing out, you're likely not going to see any worse protection, but you may actually get better protection by having it spaced out more. In the United Kingdom, they actually did a three-month gap between the doses, uh, similar to what Canada has done in spacing it out. The caution there is, of course, nobody's actually studied it done four weeks apart. So manufacturers, they can't guarantee its effectiveness because they haven't studied it. So they're not going to do that. Health Canada licensed it based on the clinical trial. So it's licensed for a three to four week interval as opposed to a longer interval. But that's not to say that it's not effective. It's just that it hasn't been approved or studied for that. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty, but there's some reason to think it's more effective. The reason as a policy that we've adopted during the four month interval in Canada rather than just a one month interval was that if you're you know, giving a dose of vaccine now and 
you have to come back in four weeks from now, you're taking the vaccine you have four weeks from now and using it for second doses. If you delay second doses, that means you're doing new people with that first dose of vaccine four weeks from now. So you can actually, you know, speed up how quickly you roll out vaccine by almost twofold because you're, you know, instead of using 100,000 doses of vaccine for half a first dose, half a second dose, you're now using 100,000 doses of vaccine all for first doses. So you get double the number of people protected with one dose of vaccine. And that one dose of vaccine gets you 95% of the protection you're going to get. And because we're seeing COVID-19 spreading, because we want to get as many people protected as quickly as possible to get things under control, it made sense from a policy reason that we delay that second dose, try to get everybody a first dose so we can get all the uh, population protected at least 95% of the way. And that will let us actually start to exit some of the uh, measures we have in this pandemic. Thank you for that. And um, one last question on the same issue and that has also been asked uh, quite regularly is the question, do we have to be vaccinated on an annual basis moving forward? So we're looking in the short term, we're looking at yeah. saying like here is when we have our first vaccination. This is when we're hoping to have that the majority of Canadians have their second vaccination in place. But what does 2022, 2023 look like when we look at vaccinations? Yeah, the unfortunate part here is that we really don't know. The only way you find out if vaccine works over time is by watching people over time who've been vaccinated and seeing if they're getting sick. So the clinical trials show that a few months out, it was working and that was the basis in which vaccines were approved. So we know the vaccines will work for a few months. We don't know much beyond that. We're starting to see with places like the United Kingdom, they started to vaccinate in December. So we're a good, you know, four to five months out from that, and we're still seeing that people are protected. So we have a good sense that it's gonna last at least that long, but really it's only time will tell that after we're a year or two years out, are we still getting protection from the vaccine or not? Unfortunately, there's never been a coronavirus vaccine before, so we can't even use you know, an analogy to compare to a similar vaccine. It's a completely new disease for which uh, vaccines, so uh, only time will tell if we need to get booster doses or not. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. This is a question from uh, Jennifer, who's one of our participants today. And uh, their question is, is it your recommendation that employers continue to allow employees to work from home beyond the end of this lockdown and potentially until vaccination? What is a safe time to resume work uh, in an office building? Yeah, I, I absolutely do recommend that. As I talked about, when people have close interaction, that creates the opportunity for infection to spread. And by letting and enabling people to work from home, you basically break off the opportunity for infection to spread within the workplaces, helping you know, keep our entire society safe, but particularly keeping your business safe so you don't have employees getting sick and unable to work. So absolutely, I think we need to continue trying to encourage and support as many people to work from home until we're at a stage where most of us have protection from vaccine, cases are really low, and we can start to gradually bring people back to work. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, on the same tone, kind of along the same line, the daily vaccination rate in Niagara seems to be steady at about three to three and a half thousand per day. What needs to be done to grow this number significantly other than access to vaccines, which has been one of the reasons that this number has not been greater than that? Yeah, you know, and actually, if you look at our data today, I think we're at about 4,600 doses were delivered yesterday. So it does fluctuate a little bit. My sense is we're closer to 3,400 on weekdays. It drops a bit on weekends, particularly I think with primary care offices not necessarily being open, maybe some pharmacies not being open. But the other part actually is we get a shipment of vaccine typically on Mondays and we run through it and we try to get it out as fast as possible and we're actually running low by the weekends. And so that is another reason the drop off happens. So the biggest factor actually in terms of us being able to vaccinate more would be to actually have more supply. Uh, you know, I think if we were going all out in Niagara, we could uh, be at least at probably 6,000 doses a day, really, you know, with a couple days turnaround to doing that. Uh, in public health, we're actually still hiring more people so that we can scale up to be able to get to the point where, as a Niagara community, we could be doing 10 to 12,000 vaccinations a day if supply ever got quite that high. Uh, the biggest limiting factor right now is we just don't have that supply. The one good thing if, uh, you know, that this has enabled though is that because we have a small amount of supply, we're running smaller clinics, is we've been able to actually find out locations in all parts of Niagara. So we can actually go to different parts of Niagara to make sure that there's good access to vaccine. 
particularly for elderly residents who might not be able to travel as far. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen such high coverage in the 90% range for some of our elderly people, because we've actually been able to get to the communities where they are and make it really easy for them to access vaccines. So that's the kind of silver lining to, you know, being running smaller clinics. But I think we'd all prefer that we have a lot more vaccine. We can start to vaccinate people more quickly. And actually, on that note, it's actually it leads uh, quite well into this other question that has come forward, and that is looking at and business have often asked about it, what are the actual physical risk areas that we have early on we looked at senior citizens homes long term care facilities of being at a higher risk for spreading. Mm -hmm. Has there been data to look at what kind of employment or workplaces um, are currently bigger contributors to it spreading it um, than maybe other areas of it? Because there's always been a level of confusion yeah. where people are saying, and a lot of business in the majority of businesses, Dr. Hoji, have been following the guidelines diligently. Yeah. Um, and uh, but we still see the spread happening in some areas. Could you shed some light on this one? Sure. So, you know, as I talked about, when people have close interaction, that creates the opportunity for infection to spread. And so actually our highest risk is actually not in the workplace, it's actually in the home. One person gets sick of COVID-19 out in the community at work, they bring it back to the home and that's where you have your closest interaction with others. Usually once one person brings infection to the home, it spreads to everybody else in the home. Uh, a corollary of that is probably after the household, the next biggest group where we see infection spreading is when people have family, friends, coworkers, and others over to the home, have a small gathering in the home, and that leads to infection spreading. And so those are actually the biggest risk factors for infection spreading. In more public places, particularly workplaces, what we're again, typically, it seems to correlate really well with when people are close together. So manufacturing, you're working on an assembly line, just the nature of the work, you know, you can't really space people farther out, the stations are where they are on an assembly line. Those kinds of manufacturing industries, that's the kind of place where we do see a lot of spread. People working in farms, particularly in a greenhouse where it's indoors, you don't have the benefit of ventilation, you know, there's only so much space between those four walls of a greenhouse people can spread out, that's another kind of context where we see a lot of infection spreading. So it's those sorts of settings uh, where we see most infection spreading. When it comes to more white collar work environments, we typically don't see as much. We've definitely had some outbreaks in those kinds of settings, but they're much less common just because I think a lot of people there are able to work from home. The people who still do need to be in the office, you're able to space out across the office and you're actually able to keep it relatively safe as a result. Yeah, that makes sense. This is another question from one of our attendees. And Cindy is asking, do you feel that the current provincial measures are enough until mass vaccination is achieved? And there's a second part to that question, and that is looking at, do you look at mass vaccination as the first shot or having both shots? And I think that's an interesting one uh, for us to get a better understanding on as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so on the first one, are the provincial measures enough? Again, this is sort of similar to one of my earlier ones where it's a bit of looking the future of ball. I, I really hope so. And I am hoping that little downward tick I showed in the graphs earlier is showing that they have actually started to work and we're starting to see the benefit of it. Um, we'll only know over the course of time. The key part is those graphs I showed of people's mobility and making sure people are living their time away from their household. Uh, literally keeping their social interactions to just their household so they're not having social interactions with others. And any measures that help promote that are good. And I think measures that aren't promoting that are ones that we probably shouldn't be exploring. So I'm hoping that we are seeing that the measures are starting to work, but I think we'll need a little bit more time to be sure. Uh, other countries that have had uh, big third ways like the United Kingdom, Israel, they did find that lockdowns were successful. So I'm hoping we see that same success here. In terms of vaccination, then, in terms of uh, mass vaccination, I, I think mass vaccination is going to be getting that first dose because that gets you 95% of the way to protection. But we're then going to need to get that second dose in the people to make sure we top it up and give them as much protection as possible. And I think that's particularly important because we're seeing these variants of COVID-19, which are basically mutations of the virus. And some of these mutations make the vaccine less effective against the virus. They're still effective, but not as effective. And so I think that second dose becomes even more important to make sure we've maximized the protection we can get with those variants spreading. 
I am actually anticipating that more likely than not that we will probably have a third round of vaccinations maybe in the fall winter. Uh, just given some of the variants, some of the vaccine companies are developing booster doses that now better protect against the variants. And I think we might actually do a third round of a booster dose to give us better protection against the variants in the fall and winter. But I'm really hoping that once we have a first dose into most people, that'll get us to a stage where we're not seeing COVID-19 really spiking the way it's done right now. We'll be able to start to really reopen our economy in a sustained way. The pandemic won't be over. We'll still need to be taking some precautions, but we won't be at risk of lockdowns. We'll be able to have businesses have the certainty that they can reopen and stay open just with some of those protective measures still in place. Mm -hmm. Um, and on that note, um, there's always been, especially from the business community, and this is, I'm probably speaking from the tourism sector as well, there's always been a concern when we heard in the news that vaccines were redirected from Niagara into other areas, into other critical areas. Are we facing that same situation again, or are we able to make a stronger case for Niagara in light of us, not just from a population base, but also the tourism destination that we are. We are unique in Ontario with bringing 14 million people here. There's maybe a greater need or higher need uh, to have and a priority need to have Niagarans uh, vaccinated. Yeah, no, I totally hear that. I think, you know, our economic recovery can happen until we get the hospitality sector back up and running. Uh, back in January, of course, we had the story that vaccine was redirected away from Niagara, and we, of course, didn't get to start vaccinating until about four weeks after some other regions in Ontario. Since that time, fortunately, I think the vaccine distribution has been a lot more equitable. I didn't put a graph up here, but actually, when we compare Niagara's progress with vaccination to our peers, we actually uh, uh, compare very favorably, and we're actually ahead of most of our peers by a little bit in terms of how much vaccine we've gotten out. And I think we're above the provincial average as well. So we've been doing pretty well in terms of, I think we've been getting vaccine proportionally to other regions and we've been able to get it into arms quickly. So things have been going very well there. My one caution is that I do worry it may change over the next few weeks. With that, I showed that slide about if you focus vaccinations on those 20% hotspots, you can see a greater reduction in illness and death. Most of those hotspots, I think over 60% of them are in Toronto, Peel, and York region. And I think the province is going to probably start to prioritize vaccination into those areas, particularly since those are the areas where the hospitals really are full, where they are seeing the most people uh, overwhelming ICUs. Uh, and I think because of that, they're going to really want to try and get a bit more vaccine there to help really bring things under control there. And so things might unfortunately slow down a little bit of, with our vaccination here in the next little while. I'm hoping that once things are better under control, that uh, that vaccine will move to becoming more equitable here and we'll be able to start vaccinating people at some of the hospitality sectors. You know, I showed the phase two of the province's vaccination plan was really going until uh, the latter part of June. I'm really hoping by late June, July, vaccine will really be open to everybody and we can make sure that all sectors get vaccinated at that point. And, I think you know there's perhaps a role that we could work with the hospitality sector to arrange uh, for them to bus their uh, uh, workers over to our clinics to make sure that we get everybody vaccinated at that point. Yeah, um, Dr. Hoji, I'm conscious of the time because we only have mm -hmm. 10 minutes left, and there's about quite a few more questions. Um, so I'm uh, I'm trying to get as many in as possible. Okay. But here's one question because you brought up Toronto and Peel. Um, they were in the news recently and saying that Toronto and Peel are planning possibly to close businesses with five or more COVID-19 cases uh, or cases that are directly linked to their workplace. Um, and what are your thoughts on it? And is this something that would be considered for Niagara? Yeah, you know, I, I'm still waiting to see the details of the orders at Toronto and Peel issue. I think they said they would come out on Friday. Uh, I do wonder if part of the thinking here is that, you know, in the course of contact tracing, if we identified an outbreak, we'd work with that workplace to stop the outbreak, which in some cases might mean a temporary closure of that workplace or sending people home. I'm wondering with just how high cases are in Toronto and Peel that they can actually do that kind of follow up anymore. We're actually stretched doing that in Niagara as well. And so they're using this as kind of a measure where we can kind of automate that work. Uh, and maybe it's a bit you know, broader in terms of the extent of what they use to stop the outbreak, but it's sort of automating to make sure those outbreaks get controlled. 
At this time, we're not thinking of doing that here in Niagara and hopefully we don't reach that stage where we need to have that happen. We've fortunately not seen, as I said, workplaces are the biggest driver for our spread right now. It's really more households, household gatherings. And so we're not as focused on doing something in workplaces at this point. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, business uh, really do appreciate it uh, too mm -hmm. and appreciate hearing that from you. Um, one particular sector and the question is coming from the construction sector and it's essential construction is continuing in Ontario and in Niagara, but construction work often requires that workers are in proximity um, and indoors. Um, how can employers best protect their employees during essential construction projects? Yeah, so, you know, I think going back to that concept about, you know, close interaction great increases risk. So first off, is there any way to minimize the number of people indoors at a time? You know, often you have two or three different trades working inside a building. Can you kind of sequence them so only one person or one trade is in at any one time? That actually reduces the number of people, spaces them out, hopefully leads to uh, reducing the spread of infection. Of course, wearing masks is something that we should all be doing whenever we're close to other people because that reduces the spread of infection. And so absolutely, I think construction workers should be wearing masks when they're working in indoor space, especially with others around. And then something else that can help is if we improve ventilation, that's really the biggest difference between being indoors versus outdoors. Indoors, you have four walls, so people might cluster close together, but also you have uh, no ventilation or less ventilation. So any virus that gets in the air can kind of linger there without being blown away. So if there's ways to increase ventilation, open windows, have fans blowing the air out of those windows, you know, especially in a building that maybe doesn't have all its walls up, if you can delay that to keep the ventilation up as long as possible, that's another thing that can help with preventing the spread there. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a question actually on the screening tests that are available uh, to individuals and to employers as well. Across select communities in Ontario, as well as across Canada, there is more of an uptake by employers of these screening tests, such as the Abbott test. Both the federal and provincial government have invested heavily into them and they're making them available. Uh, previously in Ontario, we needed to have them administered by a medical professional, which I think the Ontario government changed those rules uh, and guidelines. What role do they play in keeping a workplace safe? How effective are they? Uh, and is this a tool that we need to more consciously consider? Yeah, so the province does have a rapid testing program that businesses can sign up for. Um, I, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm sometimes for these testing programs. And I do think there can be some value to it, but I think there needs to be a couple of cautions around it. First off is that they aren't 100% effective. And actually in many cases, they're not super effective. Uh, there's some studies showing that at the early stages of infection, they're about 50% accurate actually picking up infection. So that's not really that great. The other part is, of course, there is cost to actually running that. Um, you know, you do need to have someone who's going to take the swab, actually run it through the machine, get the test results. I know in long-term care homes where it's been rolled out, that's actually meant that they've actually increased, I think, by about on no, average about two people per shift to actually run the rapid testing. So there is a cost to a business to doing that. I the way I would look at the rapid testing is it's basically an add-on to the screening we already do. So when someone's coming into the workplace, they need to work in the workplace, we should be doing a screening for symptoms of illness to make sure anybody who has signs of illness isn't let in. Sometimes you might add on testing for temperature as part of that. Not a super effective measure, but it gives a small incremental benefit maybe. I'd see rapid testing as maybe something that's better than the temperature check, but another incremental benefit to increase that value of screening where if someone doesn't have symptoms, maybe that rapid test might pick up that they might be brewing infection and you have a, uh, another you know, measure that you can use to hopefully keep someone who's sick out of the workplace. But it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna come at a cost. So just taking into account those cautions. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, this is again uh, looking at uh, some questions from the tourism sector. Uh, mm -hmm. A year ago, Canada was reluctant to open the border uh, to the COVID-19 devastated US. Now it is the White House that is reluctant to open the border to Canada because we are far behind when it comes to vaccinations. What metrics do you think would make it safe to reopen the border? And then the second part of this question is probably, we have a long border, the longest one in the world. And mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on a regional reopening of the border? Yeah, uh, so 
Well, the U.S. cases are unfortunately, our cases are higher than the U.S.'s cases now. It doesn't actually mean the U.S.'s cases are low right now. So I do think there's probably merit on both sides to keep the border closed a little longer. I think what this really comes down to is we need to get cases down on both sides of the border so that we don't have risk of infection spreading from one side to the other. Uh, if we get vaccinations up on both sides of the border, and I think we're on the way there, that also decreases the risk of infection spreading because people are going to be vaccinated. And then the one other thing we want to focus on is these new variants that are emerging and making sure that we're not reopening a border to a new variant coming its way into from the US. So those would be the three metrics, getting cases down, vaccinations up, and hopefully not seeing any kind of really unique variant spreading in the US that we would be concerned about. And at that stage, it's safe to start opening the border. In terms of a regional reopening, I think it's a possibility where you could have a province in certain states choose to reopen. I, I do worry about some of the international politics and coordination of that because, of course, it'd be a decision made by the Canadian government and the US government, and would they be that kind of coordination where they could agree with provinces and states to do that? It would be theoretically possible that, say, if BC still had high cases, but Ontario's are low, that you could you open the border with New York, but maybe you don't reopen it with uh, uh, um, Washington state over in the US. But I don't know if that's gonna be realistic for how governments work at the national level. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And your thoughts on a vaccination passport that has been in the news as well, the idea that do people who have chosen to be vaccinated and who've been privileged enough to have access to the vaccine uh, that they can identify themselves and therefore maybe are able to travel or make different decisions than those who haven't been vaccinated? Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I, I do worry that there's some pretty big ethical issues around that. Uh, you know, right now, of course, certain groups can get vaccinated and others can't. So we start to create a two tier society where some people are able to do certain things because they have that passport and other people don't. And is that really what we want to do? I think part of what helps us combat COVID-19 is also having that social norm where we're all dealing with the same kind of precautions and uh, measures of protection the same way. I also note that vaccines are not a 100% effective. So even if you have that vaccine passport, you are still potentially going to be at risk of getting COVID-19 and bringing it back and spreading it to others. So I, I think it's an interesting idea to explore. I would sort of caution that we would go down that road until we have everybody having had the opportunity to be vaccinated. And then hopefully we're relieving those measures really on everybody and at most just creating incentive for some holdouts to vaccination getting vaccinated as opposed to denying people who haven't had the opportunity yet. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'm um, so looking at the time, um, I'm usually giving our guests a minute to kind of a closing comments. Uh, I would like to do the same. And uh, uh, just because we're getting close to two o'clock. Yeah, you know, I, I don't have much in the way of comments here. I just want to first off, I think, acknowledge that I, I do recognize the business community has had a very difficult 13 months here. It, it's not lost to us. Uh, you know, many of my colleagues, many of our staff in public health actually have spouses who own a business, for example. So we definitely do hear that. And it's a real sad and unfortunate necessity that we've had to uh, really turn businesses in some cases into victims to help us keep people safe and alive during this pandemic. And hopefully there'll be the real opportunity for all of our businesses to recover once we're through this pandemic. You know, uh, very much, you know, much appreciate hearing any feedback from our businesses. If there's ways we can tweak things to make it easier, we absolutely want to hear it and invite that feedback. So please do send it to us. And beyond that, I think, you know, let's all just stick together these last couple of months at this worst part of the pandemic till we're at a stage where we can start to have that sustained reopening and we can all start to enjoy society back to the way it used to be. Yeah, I do really appreciate your time actually that you spend with us because I do believe that these dialogues and focus on facts mm -hmm. make a significant difference uh, in the perception and for people being able to ask uh, questions. We have and I wanted to thank you on behalf of uh, our members in the business community for being available uh, on a monthly basis for this webinar. I'm uh, encouraging everyone who's in attendance and who's interested in being part of the webinars to please uh, check out the times at gncc.ca. We are recording uh, 
each one of the sessions too. So in case you have questions afterwards or wonder if any of it has been addressed, uh, it is available to us again on our website and it will also be shared with everyone who has uh, joined us here this afternoon. Dr. Hurdy, I um, thank you for being with us and thank you and your team for all that you do uh, in keeping Naga safe. And um, one of my colleagues at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce always ends uh, a call by saying stay positive and test negative. And somehow that seems to be a very appropriate way to wrap up this webinar. So thank you very much and stay safe. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you.